End of 1943. The German army has lost more than 2 million soldiers during this last year, in which after a new great defeat on the Eastern Front and the Allied invasion of Southern Italy, it has become clear that Germany is not going to, to be able to win World War II. However, despite the fierce fighting that has taken place since the conflict began, the savage battles are yet to come. After making great efforts to re-establish solid defensive lines both on the Eastern Front and on the Atlantic Wall, between the months of June and August 1944, everything fell apart again. Thus, it is estimated that between the defeat in France and the one suffered by the Germans along the entire Eastern Front during these three months, the Wehrmacht once again suffered more than a million casualties. Although at this moment the quality of these soldiers could no longer be compared with that of those who participated in the first campaigns, those who were to come later would be even worse. In this way, the Germans had already sent practically all the men they had to the battlefield, but by the end of 1944, the need for new soldiers to defend the borders of Germany was greater than ever. But how were they going to do it? Where were they going to be able to get hundreds of thousands of new soldiers, who would be capable of containing the final offensives that the Allies were going to launch against Germany. Well, this is exactly what we are going to see in detail below. It all began with Hitler's Decree No. 58, issued on July 18, 1944, in which he gave instructions to begin preparing the defense of the original borders of the Third Reich. From here, and after the attack that took place two days later, Himmler convinced him that what they really needed were new divisions that could transmit a new fighting spirit. These were to be the so-called Volksgrenadier divisions. In this way, to highlight the latent nationalist character of the German people, Himmler named these new units with this term, which in our language means People's Grenadier. In addition, this name designates both the popular character of the division, and also refers to a type of elite troop from the 19th century these being the Grenadiers. As we can see, the propaganda character of this name is immense, and it strengthens the bond of the people with that of these new divisions that are going to arise. However, this name evoked yet another special element. Both the Soviets and the British added the term, Guard, to their best divisions. This indicated that said unit had carried out an important action on the front, and its combat value was very high. On the contrary, the Germans at this time were going to create new divisions that had no combat experience, but somehow had to be made to look like it. This new Volksgrenadier title would set them apart from other army units, and new soldiers were expected to do battlefield merit to honor their name. In addition, facing the Allies, they were going to remain as special units, and there could be the confusion that they were elite units similar to those of the Waffen-SS. The reality was quite different. To do this, let's go back to the initial question, where was Himmler going to get the soldiers necessary to create up to 49 new divisions of this type? The first measure to be able to start creating them was to unite several old infantry divisions, which, after having been crushed on one of the fronts, needed to be completely rebuilt. However, this measure was misleading as they were only uniting old divisions to give the appearance that new units were being formed. What they really needed were more soldiers. Thus, to complete these divisions with combatants, Himmler organized all kinds of raids inside Germany to find the last men who could be mobilized. In addition to reinstating any potential deserters, these military police groups could recruit any civilian who was doing non-essential work for the war, or whose job position could be filled by a woman. This process was also repeated by military hospitals, which were forced to discharge their patients much earlier than normal. This sent soldiers who were not yet healed from their wounds into combat, with the result that we can all imagine. On the other hand, as the hundreds of thousands of Luftwaffe or Kriegsmarine ground staff were no longer needed in their respective corps, they now began to be integrated into these new infantry divisions to fight on the front lines. Although the Kriegsmarine had personnel numbers commensurate with its function, the Luftwaffe had grown to reach the exorbitant number of almost 2 million troops. Although this was due to the desire for power of Hermann Goering, 
who wanted to have as many personnel as possible under his control. It was already from 1942 when part of those Luftwaffe troops began to enter the here progressively. Finally, it was also necessary to resort to ethnic Germans, drawn from category 3 of the folk list. But what was the folk list? Basically, it was a list of racial categories created by the Germans in late 1939 that groups ethnicities according to the amount of Germanic gene they possess. This list was created at first to classify the Poles, but after the new conquests it was also used in those new territories. In total, he classified ethnic Germans into four categories. In category one, we have the so-called confessional Germans, who had campaigned for German nationality before the war. That is, they were organized in German minority organizations, regardless of whether they could prove German ancestry. In category two, we have people who were not members of German minority organizations, but who had retained the German language and culture. In category three, there were so-called tribal Germans, who were people said to be of German descent, even though they usually no longer spoke German. Finally, we have category four in which the so-called renegades were. They were persons who, according to the German civil administration, were of German descent but had slipped into Polish. For practical purposes, they were considered Poles or their nationality in question. They received the revocation of their German citizenship and were exempt from military service. Those of the first two categories had already been mobilized for combat on this date. Regarding those of category three, even though these people were in a lower category, from here on, they were perfectly valid to be used in combat. These soldiers came from countries such as Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Yugoslavia, or Czechoslovakia, with the peculiarity that many did not even speak German. These measures were what made possible the formation of these 49 divisions during the last months of the war, and it was on them that the burden of defending the borders of the Third Reich fell, as well as carrying out the last desperate offensives. At an average of between 7,000 and 10,000 troops that each of these divisions had, it gives us a total figure of almost half a million combatants in more or less favorable conditions, compared to other bodies such as the Volkssturm that we also recently analyzed on the channel. However, these numbers raise serious questions. Among this mix of young soldiers, in many cases as young as 16, veteran men, wounded, foreigners, airmen or sailors, there was very little cohesion. Morale was generally quite low, as they only had to look at each other to see that their country was completely exhausted. On the other hand, although the estimated time to train the members of a division for combat was 12 weeks, on this occasion, they were not going to enjoy such courtesy, and most were sent to the front line after having received six weeks of training, or even less. The result was disastrous. Training did not extend beyond that conducted at the company or battalion level. This caused regiment commanders to become unfamiliar with the management of their unit and did not learn to maneuver with units of that size. Thus, it would be in the first real combats in which the unit would gain this experience at the cost of very high casualties. In this way, the training was generally limited to the tactics and coordination of combined arms of small units and to the defense in static positions. In relation to this matter, on December 1, 1944, Marshal von Rundstedt, who was the commander-in-chief of the German armies in the West, sent a letter to Alfred Jodl, who held the position of chief of operations of the OKW. In this letter he said the following. The training state of the newly arrived Volksgrenadier divisions is poor due to the insufficient time of their instruction. Shortening the training time even more was not foreseen, but the critical situation at the front has demanded that these units enter into combat hastily. Furthermore, since there is no pause between combats, it is impossible to finish their training once they are at the front lines. To these last words from Rundstedt we have to add that if there were a pause in any sector of his front, it would not be of much use since a new crisis somewhere else would cause the sending of said units there. Well, this is how the Germans were able to continue resisting on their borders in a more or less effective way during late 1944 and early 1945, in addition to being able to carry out their last offensives. 
Of all the measures we have seen, which one has caught your attention the most? If you want to expand this information, I leave you in the description the program that we did on the Vox term. Thank you all so much for being part of this community, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you as always every Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.